Our next speaker really embodies UCLA Law's commitment to public service and to entrepreneurship and professional excellence all at once. Uh, Jack Weiss is the co-founder and president of Blue, Blue Line Grid and, yes, a member of the class of 92. Um, he was editor-in-chief of the UCLA Law Review and uh, served as an assistant U.S. attorney, but some of you may also know him as best as your former city councilman. Uh, from 2001 to 2009, he served that role in District 5, uh, which happens to be where we are all sitting now. Uh, I'm still waiting for those potholes on Beverly Glen. To... <laughs> I won't go there. But seriously, Jack, we are absolutely delighted to have you with us um, and welcome. Thank you very much, Dean. And, um, one of the themes of my life is to try to overwrite all of the neurons that used to be devoted to being your city council members. So um, I'm going to try to get a little more of those neurons overwritten uh, in the next 10 minutes. But it is, it's thrilling to be here. It is, it's, it's uh, amazing to see so many people from our class. It's really, it's really cool. And I, and it's, and it's, I can just, I can just tell. It's, a, it's just a very contagious, happy thing that that all of us get to experience over the next two days. So thanks, thanks to everybody for, for coming. Thank you for giving me the chance to talk today. Um, the reason I like to talk about pivots is because at this stage, when you're 25 years out of law school, you and a lot of your colleagues are making transitions. It's just the normal order of things. Um, tomorrow, for me, is a particularly unusual transition because we have our 25th, and my daughter is taking the LSAT. And it is a, it's such a cruel, sad, awful thing. And um, I feel sorry for anyone taking the LSAT. I feel sorry for the parents of anyone taking the LSAT. Um, but, uh, but maybe, maybe it's, uh, it's all for the best. Look, I, I, I'm going to offer you some very brief vignettes um, about thoughts on change and maybe how to appreciate the change that all of us are going through and that young law students have to experience. Um, for me, the story begins the way it does for so many of you, right down the hall um, in the Duke's class. That was my very, very first class in law school. Um, I remember the Duke calling on Mr. Trenor. I remember him saying, Mr. Trenor, I have no idea what the case was. I have no idea what, what, what the actual message was that day. But through him, through other great professors, I remember Lucy White. I don't know if any of you had Professor White. Um, she would talk about balancing tests. She would balance things with her hands in front of her. And, and, and the message that I got was that what we were being taught was that law is this powerful thing, but it's going to evolve slowly, carefully, cautiously. That's the nature of change that I learned here. And I took that as sort of my worldview into politics. And I went into politics, I'll never forget, I asked my first campaign manager, really essentially, how do things work around here? Because I wanted to understand you know, the lingua franca. And she said, look, the great news here is you can always change your mind. And I thought, wow. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and she was wrong. <laughs> it, it sucked. And I mean, Janice is maybe the only person in this room who remembers this issue. It was called the Valley Busway. None of you need to remember it. None of you need to know about it. But I changed my position on that within a few months of getting elected. And it was a horrible thing. And this is when I learned the truly incoherent way in which we deal with change in politics, which is all elections are about change. Truly, every campaign is about change. Um, but politicians may not change, right? Because if you change, you're a flip-flopper, you have no principles, you've turned your back on your record. And so there's this really weird thing that we do where we demand change, and yet we really don't accept it when it happens. Um, and then, of course, that's, that's putting aside the bureaucracy, which is um, a pretty change-averse bunch, right? I mean, the answers I would always get, I would categorize them into, into three lessons whenever you would ask, at least at the city level, an agency to change. It was always, um, we've always done it this way, we've never done it that way, or the best one, we tried it once and it didn't work. <laughs> um, so I took these weird 
worldviews from politics and law school into tech, which is what I do now. And, and, it, and you know, I was not prepared for the sorts of things you need to do um, to even have a fit, you know, any chance of competing in technology. And the thing you need to learn to do in tech is pivot. I'm gonna define pivot in a second, but let me just tell you, literally in three and a half years, my business partner and I have, I'll, I'll, I'll give you eight pivots, but there are more. We started off doing social media monitoring for movies. Then it became social media monitoring for law enforcement. Then it became a professional network for law enforcement. Then it became a mobile professional network for law enforcement. Then a mobile professional network for all government. Then a paid mobile communication service to government agencies. Then we opened it up to the private sector as well. And now we've built so much technology that we actually sell the technology itself to other tech companies for them to use. All these things are called pivots. Um, in business and in tech, you talk about pivot. The most important thing about pivoting, and this is, um, and, and this is like, it's something I have to talk about with myself every day because it is hard. Pivoting is not about changing your mind because it's pretty easy in life to change your mind when you figured out you were doing something wrong. Pivoting is about making a change when you're doing something right. Pivoting is about making a change when you got to where you are through an analytically sound, procedurally sound method. You've got the support of your investors, your board, your partner, and you still decide you've got to make a change. And I can tell you for myself, that has not come easy. It is a painful process. And I listed those eight pivots because it's still happening. And for us to continue to be successful in tech, we will keep pivoting. Um, I was reflecting on this this week as I was putting these notes together to come and deliver this talk because the obvious question is, well, what does a law school do? How does a law school prepare students to, to participate in this economy and to make these sort of decisions? And you, you have to teach precedent. You have to teach common law. That's what we were all trained in. It's important. It's the work of lawyers. And I was trying to think, well, are there examples of of, of dramatic pivots happening right before our eyes in the law. And this week, one popped into the news. It, it was such a cool story. I'm sure the dean saw it, and probably some of you did as well. Um, Judge Richard Posner uh, decided to retire from the circuit court. He's been there 30 years. And I don't know if any of you saw his interview with Adam Liptak in the New York Times this week. It's mind-blowing. He said, I am retiring from the court because I want to help indigent litigants. And why am I doing this? Because we have a method of reviewing indigent petitions, and it's, it's, it's solid, right? It's a solid procedure. It's lawful. It's constitutional. They've got a series of staff attorneys who are reviewing all of these memos and preparing memos, reviewing petitions, and it's pissing them off. It's pissing him off. I, I, I don't know who's right or wrong. Um, he's written a book about it. He's going to de dedicate the next years of his life to it. And I read about that and I thought, you know, that's a pivot. That's a pivot in the law. That's someone who has come to appreciate that something that he, and in this case his colleagues on the circuit, are doing, they've been doing it for years, they've been doing it for all the right reasons, the, you know, two plus two is four, the arithmetic adds up, and yet he has still decided to make um, a huge change. And it's big news when it happens. Um, I, I, I don't know what the law school class would look like where you're training minds not to be glib because anyone can do that, but to really look and examine what you're doing and decide, I got here for all the right reasons, but I still need to make a change. Um, in technology, um, you don't have a choice but to learn how to do this because if you don't do it, um, you're dead. Um, I suspect that for uh, you know, the next generation of law students, like kids like my daughter, um, it's, it's not going to be optional to learn how to think this way. Um, precedent and common law are critical, but the sort of changes that many of us are going through in our careers, just look at our class Facebook page, right? People are going through all sorts of transitions. Um, we're all going to need to learn how to take a deeper look 
um, not just at our, um, at our mistakes, but also at our successful decisions. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me today.